Disney insiders brag about injecting LGBTQIA plus minus divided sign percentage sign little tilde thing that goes over Spanish letters propaganda into kids content. Jon Stewart says white people are all racist and Kamala Harris says lynchings are not a thing of the past. She's the black vice president, by the way. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. It's time to stand up against big tech. Protect your data at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Speaking of which, big tech, it controls pretty much everything in your life. At this point, it controls how information flows. It monitors your data. So why exactly would you allow them to use that data to make money off of you? Instead, it's time to put a layer of protection between your online activity and big tech. That is why I use ExpressVPN. Think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, every site you visit, video you watch, message you send gets tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address, something big tech can use to personally identify you. So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. And ExpressVPN does all of this without slowing your connection. That's why it's rated the number one VPN service by both Mashable and Tech Radar. What I like most about ExpressVPN, it's really, really easy to use. Download the app on your phone or computer, tap one button, and now you are protected. So stop handing over that personal data to big tech because they're just going to take that activity and sell the information and then use it against you. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep myself safe online. It's expressvpn.com slash Ben, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben to get three extra months for free. All righty, so Ron DeSantis, the most evil governor in America, of course, signed into law the Florida Parental Rights in Education Bill, which says merely that you are not allowed to indoctrinate without parental permission small children into your sexual orientation and gender identity nonsense. That is all the bill says. That is the entirety of the controversial status of this bill. And now it is a national issue. And it's a national issue because the left has decided, they really believe this, that you should be able, and you must, in fact, as a moral person, indoctrinate small children into gender fluidity and equality of sexual orientation at the youngest possible ages. This is the goal. The White House yesterday, Kate Bettingfield over at the White House, she actually said that the Department of Education is now going to evaluate whether or not this Florida bill, this Parental Rights in Education Act, violates federal civil rights law. Because in 1965, when they were writing the Civil Rights Act, what they clearly had in mind is that your child, your five-year-old, should be taken away from you and informed that he might be a she. And if you won't allow your child to be taken away by the local authorities and indoctrinated in a bunch of absolute gobbledygook nonsense damaging to your child, then this means that you're violating federal civil rights law. Here is the White House making this announcement yesterday. The president also uh, put out a statement uh, yesterday uh, about the uh, tragic impact of this kind of law on incredibly vulnerable uh, uh, population. And he said that, you know, by signing this bill, the governor has chosen to target some of Florida's most vulnerable students and families, all while under the guise of parents' rights. So the Department of Education, as you noted, uh, will continue, will monitor uh, this law upon implementation uh, to evaluate whether it violates federal civil rights law. These people are insane. They're insane, and it's purely non-violative of federal civil rights law, of course. Okay, in order to understand what's truly happening here, I think we have to start from a few very basic premises. These should be non-controversial. And the truth is they are non-controversial. But some people will argue that they are controversial specifically because they wish to avoid the consequences of the argument. So here are the controversial points. One, children are malleable and thus vulnerable. That is point number one. Children are not tiny adults. They are malleable. They don't know things. They have to be treated with care. They are innocent. They are placed into your protection by God above or nature, whichever you prefer, and it is your job to protect their innocence because they are malleable, because they don't know what to think, because they will believe pretty much anything, because they have wild imaginations. Children are malleable. The left knows this. The right knows this. The right and people who are moderate and mainstream liberals wish to protect kids. The radical left wishes to prey on children and turn them into little widgets of social change for them. Okay, so premise number one, children are malleable and thus require protection. Premise number two, sexual behavior is malleable. Sexual thought is malleable. Now, I understand that the left wishes to say that this is rigid. It's encoded in your DNA. And what you are and how you identify, all of that is encoded in your DNA from the time that you are a small baby and it's manifest at the age of five. First of all, your sexual behavior is not manifest at the age of five because you don't actually have the hormones necessary for sexual behavior to take place manifesting in your body at the age of five. 
When people say that there's a gay child at the age of five, the answer is there's no such thing as a gay child at the age of five because no one is gay or straight at the age of five because no one is sexually oriented at the age of five. You don't have the hormones that are capable of orienting you sexually at the age of five. You don't even have the hormones capable of giving you sexual feeling at the age of five. And anyone who denies this is denying biology. So kids are not gay. They're not straight. They're not sexual beings. This is precisely why we have pedophilia laws in this country. Because kids are not sexual beings and therefore should not be sexualized at the age of five. Sexual behavior is malleable. Sexual identification is malleable. This has been true throughout human history. This is true whether you identify as gay or you identify as straight or you identify as bisexual. This does not mean that your orientation is not biologically encoded in part or even in large part or in some cases in entirety. It does mean, however, that there is malleability to human behavior. We're not talking about orientation now. We're not talking about feelings. We are talking about behavior. There is no such thing as a genetic encoding of behavior in you. It does not work that way when it comes to your choice of sexual partner or your choice of sexual lifestyle. Those are all choices you get to make as a human being. Now, that doesn't mean that the, all those choices are equally easy or equally desirable. This is not an argument in favor of you choosing a particular, a particular sexual lifestyle, one or another. What it does mean is that to pretend that people's sexual thoughts People's sexual behavior is not malleable, runs counter, to, runs counter to literally all available evidence, which is why, for example, you have seen skyrocketing rates of trans identification. This is not because gender dysphoria, which is, in fact, a biologically ingrained condition. It's a disorder as listed under the DSM-5, gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, whichever term you, used to choose, you choose to use. It is not that that has become wildly more prevalent in the, at this biological moment in time. That until now, evolution had basically bottlenecked gender identity disorder and gender dysphoria. But now, magically, boom, there, no one knows why. There's just a massive genetic uptick in gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria in the last generation alone. Either that, or it turns out that how people identify and how people think of themselves, a lot of that is defined by societal rules. A lot of that is defined by societal norms and by incentive structures. In other words, there is a reason why there's been a massive uptick in trans identification among young people. Well, at this point, it seems as though you might think gender theory and radical gender ideology, it's a waste of time. Well, you shouldn't be wasting your time in any case, not even when you go to the auto parts store. So here's the thing. You go to the auto parts store, you wait in line, you finally get up to the front, and the guy at the front, the long hair and the face tattoo is like, brah, we don't have that part. I'm going to order it and I'm going to upcharge you 67%. They're like, Beto, what are you working here for? He's like, well, I was running for governor, but I lost again. You're like, well, yeah. But well, if you don't want to deal with beta and you just want to go to rockauto.com and get the part, that's probably your better move. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, 100% more for the exact same auto parts at a chain store or new car dealership? rockauto.com is a family business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Head on over to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. They have everything from engine control modules and brake parts to tail lamps and motor oil, even new carpet. Whether it's for your classic or daily driver, get everything you need in a few easy clicks delivered directly to your door. The rockauto.com catalog is unique. It's remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle. Choose the brand's specifications and prices you prefer. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low and the same for professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Why would you spend up to twice as much for the same parts? Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Head on over to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that I sent you. Right, Abigail Schreier pointed this out, that historically, childhood gender dysphoria afflicted about 0.01% of the population, almost exclusively boys. Before 2012, there was no scientific literature on girls aged 11 to 21 ever having developed gender dysphoria. In the past decade, that has changed dramatically. The Western world has seen a sudden surge of adolescents claiming to have gender dysphoria and self-identifying as transgender. In Britain, Canada, Sweden, and Finland, clinicians and gender therapists began reporting a dramatic shift in the demographics of those presenting with gender dysphoria from predominantly preschool-aged boys to predominantly adolescent girls. In Britain, in 2018, there was a 4,400% rise over the previous decade in teenage girls seeking gender treatments. Now, does that sound like evolutionary biology just suddenly reversed itself? Suddenly, the biologically encoded behavior of human beings change radically overnight. Does it sound like that would happen? Or is that there's now a social contagion that is taking place with regard to identification as a sexual minority? Well, it certainly seems like the latter because there's, a, there's good polling data to suggest that this is generational. You would imagine that something as deeply biologically ingrained as sexual behavior is supposed to be 
right? It's supposed to be completely biologically ingrained. According to folks on the left, it is, it is who you are. It is in you from the moment of conception. That would mean, presumably, not tons of change in sexual behavior over the course of time. This is absolutely untrue. If you look at the latest Gallup polls, it came out like a month and a half ago. Latest Gallup poll, Americans' self-identification as LGBT by generation. You would imagine there would be a fair level of stability. No. I mean, this is, of course, the most key component we have been told of, of your identity. Who you are is mostly about where you want to put your genitals. That's, that's really what you are. Now, we have entire civilizations built along the lines that, that is not entirely what you are. This is one part of your life. You draw boundaries around it. You make behavioral choices around it that affect the rest of your life. But we in Western society have decided that the core of your being is where you wish to put your genitals. So this is the most key thing. So if this is the most key thing, you would assume a certain level of stability over time. You wouldn't assume massive change over time. Here's the, here are the stats. For those born before 1946, 0.8% identify as LGBT. Less than 1%. 0.8%. That's not for gay or for, that's for all of them. LGBTQ plus IA minus carrot sign, squiggly thing over the, over the Spanish letters, dollar sign, hashtag. 0.8%. 92.2% identify as straight or heterosexual. 7.1% no response. For baby boomers, people born between 1946 and 1964, 2.6% identify as LBGTQ. For Generation X, Born between 1965 and 1980, it starts to rise to 4.2%. For millennials, it more than doubles. For people born between the ages, 1981 and 1996, everybody who's essentially above, below the age of, of 40, between the ages of, of, say, 40 and 25, 10.5% identify as LGBT. And for Generation Z, born 1997 to 2003, 20.8%, 20.8% identify as LGBTQ. So is sexual behavior malleable? Is sexual identification malleable? I mean, clearly sexual identification is because you have a massive malleable change. You have an increase by a factor of over 20 between people born before 1946 and people born after 1997. And that trend is going to continue. If you carry this forward and you say people who are born, say, after 2003, that number is going to look more like 25% or 30%. Okay, now, that is a result of society changing its rules. Now, what people will say is that, well, this is because we live a freer and better life. This is because we have decided to remove the shackles. If these shackles had been removed in 1946, then yeah, all the old people, all the 80-year-olds, all the 90-year-olds, they too would be LGBTQ. Or alternatively, we live in a system in which there's a massive social contagion in which this sort of behavior is rewarded and that you're considered a, a victimized minority in our society, and in which there is an active push by the top levels of our culture toward children. There's an attempt to teach children in order to validate these particular political, yes, and sexual lifestyle choices. In order to validate those choices, we are going to go to small children, and we are going to encourage those small children to engage in a wide variety of sexual thoughts and sexual behaviors, and we're going to encourage this at the youngest possible. We're going to do this at five, six, seven years old. We're going to ingrain in them that the natural state of things is not a mommy and a daddy producing a baby. It is a bunch of other stuff. It's important to understand this is the making of utopia. The utopia that the radical sexual revolutionaries wanted in the 1960s is now achievable. All you have to do is get small kids away from their parents and indoctrinate them in this set of values. And they will change their behaviors. They'll start experimenting. They'll start identifying in particular ways. And then you will have created an entire society that validates your choices. That is what this is about. This is not about the protection of children. This is about the hijacking of children and the removal of their innocence on behalf of a political agenda. That's what this is about. Because there is no such thing, again, as it, there should be no such thing as a sexualized five-year-old. And yet this is exactly what the left would love. They want this because they understand, again, back to our premises, children are malleable and sexual behavior is malleable. So if you can go after small kids, and then you can change how they think about these issues and you can turn them into activists on behalf of your agenda. That's what this is about. And it's infusing all aspects of our culture. This is why the left is mad. They're not mad because they misunderstand the Florida bill. They're mad because they understand the Florida bill. They're not mad because they're lying about the Florida bill. They're mad because they know what the Florida bill actually says and they actually oppose it. The Florida bill does not say that you can't say gay anywhere in Florida. It doesn't say that if you are a kid and you go to class and you have two dads because 
you're a surrogate baby or because you were adopted or whatever. It doesn't say that you can't say, my two dads and I went on vacation this weekend. It doesn't say that in the bill. Nowhere does it say that in the bill. It says you are not allowed to have child, childhood instruction from members of staff on, members, on matters of sexual orientation and gender identity. The left is not misunderstanding the bill. Understand. There are a bunch of people in the middle who maybe lied about, they, maybe they heard the lies from the media and so they misunderstand the bill and so they are assessing their opinions based on the lies of the media. Right? The media say, don't say gay. And they're like, oh, that sounds terrible. Ah. Okay, so they don't understand. But the activist class full well understands the bill. They actively want the indoctrination of your kids. They want to separate you off from your kids. They want your values subsumed under their own. They want your values destroyed. They want, you, they want to be the teachers of your children when it comes to their values. And they know full well that this will shape how your kids grow up. That is the point. It is not a bug. It is a feature. This is not about the protection of kids who identify as trans, gender dysphoric, small children who are a minute percentage of the population and who ought to be treated with the highest level of care and watchful waiting, not gender confirmation surgeries and hormone treatments and social transitioning away from their parents, the people who care about the most. It's not about those kids. It's about everybody else. Because the rule on the left is if you can find somebody who you can pretend is the sympathetic victim of a law, you can change the entire societal standard. So they have to invent the victims of the law. There are no victims of this Florida law. The law is designed to protect small children. They don't want small children protected. They want to invade the privacy of small children. This is their goal. The left knows exactly what this bill says, and that's the reason that they oppose the bill. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, we need better people in all major positions all across the economy. Well, this may be true at your business as well. This is why you need Zip Recruiter. Their AI is always learning. So if you are hiring, their AI gets better and faster at finding the right candidate for all of your roles. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Then it proactively presents these candidates to you. You can easily review these recommended candidates, invite your top choices to apply for your job. That encourages them to apply faster. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the United States based on G2 ratings. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. We've been using ZipRecruiter here at the Daily Wire for years. It keeps all of our employees on their toes because at any moment, the AI could swoop in and replace them with somebody better. They know it. They work better. It means we also get great employees when we get new employees. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire to get started. Now, a lot of people have been throwing around the word grooming with regard to small children. Now, grooming suggests that they want to victimize children sexually. And that, that it's, it's sort of an older term that is rooted in a sort of homophobic belief that gay men prey on young boys or whatever. And it's wrong. What they are doing, however, is ideological grooming. What they are doing is political grooming. If we can indoctrinate your kids in a particular belief system regarding morality and immorality, regarding what is good and what is bad and what is acceptable and what is celebrated, then we will have groomed you politically. And that is the actual goal, to create a society safe for me and my choices as an adult. This, by the way, underscores so much of what you see from the left. When it came to COVID, it was the same thing. You got to mask up the small kids so I don't get COVID. I was unaware that you were the victim in this situation. I was unaware that your job isn't to protect the kids. It is not the, the kids' job to protect you. It is the opposite. But again, we have a, a society run by people who are adults who act like children and believe that children must be treated like adults so that they can act like children. That is what this is really about. This is what you see in the reaction to the Florida bill. Again, they are reacting to what the bill actually says. This is the great misnomer from both, right, from both the right and the left. The left is saying, well, it says don't say gay, and that's why we oppose it. Nope, that's not why you oppose it. And the right is like, well, they're misconstruing the bill, and that's why they oppose it. Wrong. They know exactly what the bill says, and they don't like what the bill says. They don't like what the bill says because the bill runs directly counter to their agenda, and their ideological agenda is perfectly clear, as we're going to get to in just one moment. Okay, so for example, there's a teacher on MSNBC yesterday, and this teacher said, you know, I, I can't believe this. I won't be able to talk about my sex and love life with my kindergartners. Who gave you the right to talk about your sex and love life with your kindergartners? What makes that the priority? What makes your weekend in, in the Adirondacks with your husband, dude, what, what makes that a priority to your kindergarten children? What? When I was growing up in school, I had no idea what the private lives of my teachers were because who the hell cares? It was their job to do reading, writing, and arithmetic. That was it. The whole goal here is to hijack your kids and to shape, shape your kids so that those, so that those kids reflect 
the values of the teacher. Because they want to be surrogate parents. This is what they want. As a parent, my job is to shield my kids and protect their innocence. And yes, to inculcate in them values that I think are important. The left feels the same way. They just want their values to prevail with your kids. Here's this clip from MSNBC. It scares me to death that I am not going to be able to have these conversations with my children because they're going to ask me what I did on the weekend. I don't want to have to hide that my partner and I went paddle boarding this weekend because then they ask, well, what does partner mean, Mr. Bernard? And, you know, I'm worried. Can I tell them what it means? It just it opens up uh, for parents to really take some legal action against the schools and teachers. And I I am afraid uh, for myself, my colleagues and my students. Okay, my children, they're not your children. They're not your children. This is how the left thinks of them because they're everybody's children. It takes a village after all. It takes society to rip children away from their parents and then indoctrinate them, Plato's style, in the needs of the regime. This is, this is what it requires. They're building a new utopia, and that means hijacking your kids. That's what this is about. By the way, there's a quick and easy answer to this. If he says, I went with my partner paddleboarding over the weekend, which, by the way, like, why are you talking to kindergartners about this? Okay, but I went paddleboarding. Who will stand for the gay paddle boarders of Florida against the children? But you know what the actual answer to that is? If the kid says, what is a partner, Mr. Bernard? The answer is, why don't you talk to your mom and dad about it? Why don't you talk to your parents about it? Why is that such a hard answer? The answer is because they don't want you to talk to your kids about this stuff. They, they believe that they are a bulwark between kids and their bigot, horrible parents, which is why they have to step in and indoctrinate all the children. And this has bled all the way up to the White House. This is bled all, It is a crusade for them. It is a moral crusade for them. And you see this most of all at Disney, okay? Because Disney is a company directed solely and completely at the production of safe and innocent magic for children. This, I, I'm so annoyed by this, irritated by this, because yes, I grew up on Disney because everyone grows up on Disney. My kids grew up on Disney. I love taking my kids to Disney World, but I swear to God, if these assholes decide that they are going to indoctrinate my kids in their left-wing values via their movies, I will never watch their movies. I will never take my kids. My kids will live a perfectly happy life like millions of people, billions of people all over the world have, never having visited Disney World if they decide to make these choices. It is not their job to raise my kids with their values. So the entire left has now embraced the proposition that you should be able to sexually indoctrinate children. Well, if this makes you uncomfortable, let me make you a little more comfortable by telling you about something that will make your life better. That, of course, is Tommy John underwear. When you're wearing Tommy John's hammock pouch underwear, you're that much more comfortable. You can do everything better. They've got dozens of comfort innovations. Once you've tried Tommy John underwear, you're never going back. I literally took all of the other underwear in my home and I threw them away because Tommy John is great. It's comfortable and it doesn't get messed up when you wash it a lot. Like if it goes through the wash a bunch of times, it is not going to get weaker. It actually maintains its comfort level. Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. With over 17 million pairs sold, men across America love their Tommy John underwear. After 13 years, tens of thousands of five-star reviews, fanatics call Tommy John the most comfortable boxer briefs ever. There is no downside. By one pair, you'll never want to wear any other underwear again. It's true. I know because I use Tommy John underwear. They grace this magnificent tuchus right now. Shipping and returns are free. Every pair is backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Get 20% off your first order right now at tommyjohn.com slash Ben. That's tommyjohn.com slash Ben today for 20% off tommyjohn.com slash Ben. See site for details. It's the reason that I bring up Disney here is because there is Chris Rufo who does amazing work over at Manhattan Institute. He was leaked. The insider meeting between members of the Disney cast and crew and production and executives on the Florida bill. And the things these people say to each other about how they wish to rip away the innocence of children is astonishing. It's astonishing. They want your kids and they want them bad. That is the message that is coming out of Disney right now. Now, I said to my wife this morning, here's the thing. If you're a parent, it's hard being a parent. If you're a parent, and you just want to break for an hour on a Sunday, and you're like, okay, you know what? I'll use the TV as the babysitter, and my kids like the music, and they like the bright colors, and, and fine, you know, let them watch Encanto. Right? Encanto's fine. It's a fine movie. I now have to pre-screen every single thing my kid watches or reads, everything, because the left has made everything political. It used to be that the least political space was the kid's space, because after all, who would want to attack the innocence of children? Who would want to insinuate themselves between parents and kids by teaching controversial social values of the left? Who would want, what kind of sick person would do that? Who would want to do that? Well, now people want to do that. And not only do they want to do it, they're doing it. And so this means 
I now have to act. I can't just turn on Disney Plus and put on a movie. I mean, for God's sake, I can't even put on an old movie on Disney Plus without having a warning about how Peter Pan is racist or something. But I can't even put on a new movie. I could put out on Onward without having to pre-screen to see just how clear the LGBTQ plus IA minus carrot sign was going to be. How clear was this going to be? Was I going to have to, am I ready to explain to my two-year-old what is going on here in terms of the radical social policies of the left? So I have to pre-screen everything. That's a lot of work for parents. It's a lot of work for parents. And Disney knows this, which is why they feel they can get away with it. They believe that parents are so lazy that they're just going to be like, okay, fine. You want to do your radical social values? Well, you know, what, you know, whatever. I guess I'll deal with it and you'll just, and you know, I did, they do want to watch Encanto. I mean, that's, that's the idea here. Really, Disney is counting on the laziness of parents to get away with this. They're counting on the laziness of parents to, to basically say, yeah, we know you're spending multi-million dollars on the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, and I do like the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. So, you know, that means that I will allow my kids to watch whatever Pride Festival film you have decided to, to jam into their little brains. I think they're underestimating parents by a pretty long shot because it turns out that for the vast majority of parents, this is my number one priority in life is protecting my kids. Number one with a bullet. There is no second priority. This is the only priority to me in the end. And if Disney wants to go up against parents, they are making a grave mistake considering the only people who purchase their product. My kid doesn't have my credit card number. The only person who has my credit card number is me and my wife. Those are the only people. If Disney wants my money, they're going to have to not attack me as a parent. And the reason I say this is because, again, the clips that you're about to listen to and watch here from this meeting, this Disney executive meeting, are astonishing. So here is Disney executive producer Latoya Raveno. It is an executive producer, Latoya Raveno. And, uh, and this person is about to tell you that she has leveraged what she calls her not so secret gay agenda into children's television. Not so secret gay agenda. Just right out there. I have a question. Why do you have an agenda with regard to kids? Why? Is this your job? It makes these people feel good about themselves. It's about them. It's about what it makes them feel inside. If I can indoctrinate kids into the belief that all sexual lifestyles are morally equivalent, then I have struck a blow for utopia. And I'm going to take advantage of the most powerful entertainment company on the face of the planet, Walt Disney, in order to do this. And I know that my higher-ups agree with me politically, and so they will do that. So they're taking advantage of their shareholders. They're taking advantage of their consumers, all to leverage in their own politics. It's disgusting. Here we go. All that like momentum that I felt, like that sense of, I don't have to be afraid to like, let's have these two characters kiss. Let's in the background, this are, like I was just wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me. Just adding queerness wherever she could. By the way, what are the credits for this person? We are talking about shows directed at small children. We are talking about the series Puppy Dog Pals. From 2017, 2018. We are talking about the series Final Space from 2019. We are talking about Super Monsters, Monster Pets from 2019. Rise Up and Sing Out in 2022. These are animated shows directed at children. And she's leveraging in LGBTQ messaging to children. Sound like, are these the people you want raising your kids? Really? How about Disney production coordinator, Alan March? He says his team is committed to exploring queer stories for children, of course. I've had the privilege of working with the Moon Girl team for the last two years, and they've been really open to exploring queer stories. And part of, I'm on the production side, uh, part of uh, the work that I feel like I can put in is um, making sure that we take place in modern day New York. So making sure that that's like an accurate reflection of New York. So I put together like a tracker of our background characters to make sure that we have like a, the full breadth of expression. Very important. Got to put this stuff in. The kids have to see it. It's very, very important. How about the Disney diversity and inclusion manager, Vivian Ware? This person says that Disney has now eliminated at their parks all mentions, you ready for this? Of ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls. Now, as a former Disney annual pass holder when I lived in SoCal, I can say that this was the way that they basically announced pretty much all the parades, for example. You'd have a parade down Main Street and it would be ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Now, they're not going to use that anymore. Why? Because, well, you might not be a lady or a gentleman. You might be a third unspecified sex. You might be an alien. You might be, who knows? You could be a pan-fluid, queer-identifying chicken. You could be anything. We don't know. And so we have just decided to 
go with a generic term, like birthing people, basically. We're just going to go with dreamers of all ages because we wouldn't want to alienate. Here we go. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we, we've trained, we, we've provided training for all of our, our cast members in, in relationship to that. So now they know it's, it's hello everyone or hello friends. We, we are in the process of changing over those, those recorded messages. And so many of you are probably familiar when we brought the fireworks back to the Magic Kingdom. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we say dreamers of all ages. And so I love the fact that it's opened up the creativity, the opportunity for our cast members to look at that. What, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to not use language describing actual human beings, but to use language so generic that it describes aliens and animals and uh, hello, friends. Hello. Fr hey, that's not the most radical stuff. For the most radical stuff, you have to wait for the Disney corporate president, Kerry Burke. So this person is about to tell you that 50 percent, she wants 50 percent of all characters on Disney to be LGBTQIA plus minus divided by sign percentage sign backslash colon or people of color, 50%. And the reason she wants this most of all is because she has two queer children. Here we go. I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually. Um, uh, one transgender child um, um, and one pansexual child. Um, and, and also as a leader, one of our execs stood up and said, you know, we only have a handful of queer leads in our content. And I went, what? I, that can't be true. And I, and I, and I realized, oh, it, it actually is true. We have many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories. And, and, and yet we don't have enough leads. Remember, this is all just pure biology. It's pure biology. It just happens to be. In Hollywood, an extraordinary, exorbitant number of kids in liberal areas are now identifying as trans and LGBTQIA plus minus and all the rest of it. It must just be biological bottlenecks or something. Or maybe it has to do with the social incentive structure and the values being taught to children. Maybe, as it turns out, I am correct that both children are malleable and sexual behavior is malleable. Maybe these things are malleable. Maybe it has to do with the values that are being taught to kids. Maybe that's the entire point, and they know it, which is why they are putting it in the entertainment. If they didn't believe it made a difference, they wouldn't be putting it in the entertainment. Why alienate a huge base of consumers if you can't change their behavior? The whole point is to change the behavior. The whole point is to indoctrinate entire generations of children. So I have a question. You want these people raising your kids? These ones over here? Is that is that what is is this what you are looking for? This is the this group of people who have decided that it is very important to indoctrinate your kids. This is what you want? So Florida passes this law to prevent this stuff in kindergarten to third grade. And the left goes absolutely nuts. And Disney goes absolutely nuts. And you know what? They've exposed their agenda. Now, at least they're clear about it now. At least they're clear about it now. And so parents are now on alert. So now it's on you, parents. It's on you to decide whether you wish to consume the latest Disney film. I'm not saying you can never watch another Disney film. I'm saying you damned well better pre-screen that film before you show it to your kids. You damn well better decide what you want in your kid's head before you put it in your kid's head because they have put you on notice. Now, what's amazing about this is that they didn't want to. They didn't want to. They wanted to make a statement, broadly speaking, about how they oppose this bill so they can placate the, the loudest voices inside their own contingent. That's what they really wanted in the end. That's what, that, that's what they were desiring. However, what they say behind closed doors is the thing. What they say behind closed doors is, we don't oppose this bill because it's a don't say gay bill. We know it's not a don't say gay bill. We oppose this bill because we want to indoctrinate your kids. We oppose this bill because we wish to be the activists who determine what your children think and feel and believe and what the future trajectory of their sexual lives looks like. We wish to do that. That's what they are saying to each other behind closed doors, running the most powerful corporations on planet Earth that mainline entertainment and values directly into the brains of your kids. That's dangerous and it's scary. And it should be scary to you. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis over in Florida, the governor, he makes a, a pretty obvious point. He says, you know, I, I've noticed that um, if there were a bill that banned the discussing of oppression of Uyghurs, Disney would be first on board. People ask me, you know, kind of about, you know, their posture on the bill. I said, you know what? If we would have put in the bill that you were not allowed to have curriculum that discussed the oppression of the Uyghurs in China, Disney would have endorsed that in a second. Yeah, I, I will also point out here that Disney uses Americans because we are more tolerant, because we are uh, more moderate in our social politics and all of this, they actually use us as the social experiment and our kids as the social experiment. You notice that they're not pulling out of, 
out of Disney Tokyo. Right? They're, not, they're not doing any of that, even though same-sex marriage, by the way, is still not legal in Japan. Same-sex marriage, okay? Not, not any of the rest of this, like second order stuff. I've noticed that they are, they are still running cruises, apparently, where homosexuals are banned in places like China, apparently. So yeah, it's, they push as far as they can or as far as you let them push you. So you could just say no. You could just say no. Well, all of this stuff is extraordinarily tiring. But if you're finding yourself tired, like more than usual, maybe it's because you're carrying around a little bit of extra weight and it's time to get rid of that extra weight with SOTAweightloss.com. SOTAweightloss.com has the strategy and structure to help you drop those extra pounds you might have gained over the past couple of years. One of the reasons dropping fat weight is so difficult is because life throws us curveballs. You gotta go pick up the kids from school. You have a lot going on at work. To hit your weight loss goals, your plan has to be diet related. Having an expert nutritionist on your team can change the game. No pills, no magic potions, just an easy to follow plan, weekly weigh-ins for accountability, and an amazing support team. On average, men will drop four to five pounds per week, women two to three pounds per week weekly. Check out sodawaitloss.com. Be sure to study. There are over 850 clients before and after photos. Read over 5,400 Google business reviews. The results are guaranteed to blow your mind. Soda flat out works. Call to schedule your consultation. Tell them Ben sent you. S-O-T-A weightloss.com. Sota Weight Loss is, say it with me, state of the art. S-O-T-A weightloss.com to get started. All righty. Well, it's no secret. Politics have infused pretty much everything in life, ruining pretty much everything, including sports. What was once pure entertainment is now an ad espousing the left's bizarre and obscene political ideology. But some professional athletes are not standing for it, including NBA star Jonathan Isaac. Isaac faced heavy criticism from the media for his views on social issues and vaxes over the past few years, and he still stood strong. That is why I'm extremely excited to announce he has a book with The Daily Wire. It's called Why I Stand. Jonathan's book will be about the rise of his basketball career, his journey into faith, his strength to stand alone in the face of immense pressure. The book is available for pre-order right now at Amazon. Again, it's called Why I Stand. Go get it right now. Reserve your copy today. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. <laughs> Meanwhile, our cultural elites, they hate you. They really, really hate you. They love them. Right? Everything for them is about assuring their own sense of, of virtue and and a, a place for them among the peoples. This is, this is their goal. And never do you see this more than when it comes to people who are just panderers like Jon Stewart. So Jon Stewart has a new show on Apple TV. And this new show is basically just old man spouting left-wing propaganda talking points. And it's, it's awkward. It's hard to watch. But it does demonstrate how members of the left think of you, particularly in our entertainment elite. This is how they think of you. And they wish to push the most left-wing views imaginable. So here is Jon Stewart. This is the other night doing a, and first of all, the screen cap is everything. It is a white man sitting in front of a bill, uh, in, in front of a board that says the problem with white people, the problem with white people, and it's a bunch of people, white people looking like they are carving a turkey for dinner. It's like a traditional white family. When I say traditional, I mean, it looks like mom and dad and some kids and some grandkids. The problem with white people, says this old white man. And yes, John Stewart now qualifies as an old white man. Here he is ranting about how white people are the worst, John Stewart. For however sincerely we want to reckon and listen, the truth is America has always prioritized white comfort over black survival. Black people have had to fight so hard for equality that they've been irreparably set back in the pursuit of equity. Hmm. So this 59-year-old white man is telling you that white people have always prized their own comfort. Now, apparently it doesn't apply to him, but here's the thing, it does apply to him. It does apply to him because Jon Stewart is about assuring his own comfort, his own ideological comfort. It makes him feel better to dissociate from the other bad white people. When he says this, he becomes one of the good white people. There's a point that black author Shelby Steele has made repeatedly in his book, White Guilt, that so much of our current media culture, so much of our elite culture is driven by white liberals who wish to run the whole thing. And no more even white liberals, white radical leftists who wish to run the whole thing. And the way that they get to maintain their moral imprimatur is by condemning all the other bad white people, all the other bigoted people. And Jon Stewart is indicative of this case. And so there is this very strange and awkward exchange between Jon Stewart and Andrew Sullivan, who is a gay white man, and a crazy white race-baiting lady named Lisa Bond. Lisa Bond, 
runs a an organization that is just one of the great grifts I've ever heard of. I've talked about it on the program before. She runs it with Sarah Rao. And the entire thing is she gets together with guilty white upper crust liberals and she lectures them about racism. That is it. That it is called Race to Dinner. It costs 2,500 bucks. And you can enlist the services of Race to Dinner, according to Mediaite, whose helpful grifters will come to your house, eat your food, and tell you how racist you are. It's an actual thing. And Lisa Bond runs it. So John Stewart has on Lisa Bond and Andrew Sullivan. And Andrew Sullivan points out that wokeness is a big negative. For the most, vast majority of Americans, they're not interested in being categorized by race. They want to be treated as individuals. And Lisa Bond goes off on Andrew Sullivan because, after all, he has no authority to speak. He is a white man. Now, just on the intersectional hierarchy, let's point out here that Lisa Bond is a white woman. Andrew Sullivan is a gay white man. So I don't know Lisa Bond's sexual orientation, but assuming that she's not gay, this means that he outranks her on the intersectional hierarchy because Andrew Sullivan is openly gay. That doesn't matter because Andrew Sullivan is about to say something that is not in line with leftist thinking. You only get to be on the leftist intersectional hierarchy if you agree with everything that they say which is how John Stewart gets to say the things he says. So Lisa Bond is about to rip into Andrew Sullivan and John Stewart will agree because John Stewart has lost the thread because left-wing America has lost the thread. I'm going to put everybody in the thing. All of us white people do this. I don't care if we say we're abolitionists. I don't care if we say we're progressive. I don't care if we're literally members of the KKK. Every single white person upholds these systems and structures of white supremacy. And we have got to talk about it. If I could finger snap, I would finger snap right now. Because <laughs> finger snapping. And then look at all these white people talk about how morally superior to you they are. We have to talk about it, says Lisa Vaughn. Okay, let's talk about how much money you are making off of stupid, radical leftists who think that they've alleviated their white guilt by hiring a white broad to tell them about their own internalized racism. You morons. I mean, it's just incredible. But this has bled up to every element of our society, every element. The radical left, it starts, everything that starts off as a radical left proposal in America eventually becomes mainstream. And so now you have, for example, the NFL, which has announced that they are going to create rules that force the hiring of women and people of color, force it, which, by the way, is a violation of the Civil Rights Act. And we talked at the beginning of the show about the, the Biden administration suggesting it's a violation of the Civil Rights Act for you to say, I don't want my kindergartner indoctrinated with LGBTQ propaganda. You know, it's actually a violation of the Civil Rights Act, hiring people because of their race. That is a violation not only of the Civil Rights Act, it's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. But the NFL is doing it now. According to NPR, at an owner's meeting this week in Florida, the league announced other diversity steps as well. A six-person committee of advisors from outside the NFL to review the league's hiring practices and a commitment by teams to increase diversity among team owners, a fraternity that's almost entirely white. The NFL says teams have to actually hire a, quote, a female or a member of an ethnic or racial minority as an offensive assistant coach in 2022. So it's now a make-work program for affirmative action candidates over in the NFL. Why? Because after all, we are also racist. We are also racist. And this myth must continue to be pervaded that America is a deeply racist country, despite the fact that by polling data, we are perhaps the least, the least racist country on planet Earth. It's amazing how critics of America have spent zero time actually investigating other countries. So solipsistic and self-centered. The only country on earth apparently is America. So yesterday, for example, the Biden administration signed into law a, a bill that passed nearly unanimously that made lynching a federal hate crime. Now, let's just put it this way. Ain't nobody who believes that it's not some sort of grave evil to lynch people or that it's not a hate crime to lynch people. It turns out murder has been illegal in the United States for literally all time. Murder has been illegal. In fact, in all societies, as of which I am aware, murder is illegal, as it turns out. The drive to, to suggest that we have to have an anti-lynching law is, of course, undergirded by a left-wing perspective right now. This is why you need the law, right? Everybody's, I don't know, a single person who's pro-lynching, except for maybe Jesse Smollett. There's not a single person in America who's pro-lynching. Jesse Smollett is in favor of lynching Jesse Smollett, except when he's against lynching Jesse Smollett. Otherwise, everyone is against lynching. But we needed to pass a law. And the reason, according to the left, we needed to pass a law is because lynching is happening each and every day. There's so much lynching in America. It's crazy how much lynching there is in America. So you might be saying to yourself, wait, is there a lot of lynching in America and I just missed it? Isn't the only lynching of which you heard last year the self-lynching by Jesse Smollett? That's right. But no, the entire propaganda of the left here is that we have to have an anti-lynching law. And the reason we must definitely have an anti-lynching law is because America has not changed since Emmett Till was lynched. 
We have not changed in 70, 80, 90 years. We, we've not changed. It's the same. Here is Joe Biden, who remembers the days of actual lynching because he's very, very, very old and used to hang out with racists. Here is Joe Biden talking about how we need an anti-lynching law today because racial hate is a persistent problem. From the bullets in the back of Ahmaud Arbery to countless other acts of violence, countless victims known and unknown, the same racial hatred that drove the mob to hang a noose brought that mob carrying torches out of the fields of Charlottesville just a few years ago. Racial hate isn't an old problem. It's a persistent problem. A persistent problem. Okay, I, I'm unaware. Will the anti-lynching law allow for the prosecution of the Charlottesville, the Charlottesville racist mob? Will, will it allow for that prosecution? Or were they exercising their First Amendment rights, even though what they were saying was very evil? He does not make this clear. So again, this is the, the anti-lynching law was basically just sort of a launching off point for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to suggest that America is a deeply racist country. Vote for me. So Kamala Harris said this yesterday. Also, Kamala Harris goes out there. By the way, I'm, I'm this human, Kamala Harris, tweeted out in support of Jussie Smollett after Jussie Smollett did this about how Jussie Smollett had been lynched. So t I will just take whatever Kamala Harris says with a grain of salt. But here is faux sincere Kamala Harris saying that lynching is not actually a relic of the past. Apparently, it's happening every day. Lynching is not a relic of the past. Racial acts of terror still occur in our nation. And when they do, we must all have the courage to name them and hold the perpetrators to account. Um, it's, it's happening all the time. Really, it's, it's not a relic of the past. I'm going to read you the statistics on lynching in the United States. You ready? Here's some actual statistics compiled by the University of Kentucky. Okay, here we go. Here are the lynchings by year and race. 1882, 64 white people were lynched, 49 black people were lynched. I mean, one of the great untold stories about lynching, of course, is that there is racist lynching. There's a lot of non-racist lynching as well, right? There are white people who are lynching other white people for various crimes. So 1886, for, in 1885, for example, 110 white people were lynched, 74 black people were lynched. Okay, but in 1898, at 101 black people who were lynched, 19 white people lynched. Okay, and, and these numbers are, they're horrifying, obviously. I mean, these are evil, evil crimes, what we are talking about right here. Grand total, I'm just going to give you the total, because at a certain point, basically once you get past maybe 1909, pretty much everybody who's getting lynched is black. So here are the stats, okay? 1910, 76. 1920, 61. 1930, 21. 1935, 20. These are the grand total of number of lynchings in the United States. Fast forward, 1950, two. 1952, zero. 1956, zero. 1958, zero. 1960, zero. 1962, zero. 1964, three. 1965, 66, 67, 68, zero, 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 zero. So is lynching a relic of the past? Why, yes, it turns out that lynching is a relic of the past. People are not being hanged from trees on a regular basis. This is not a thing that is happening in the United States. I mean, if you want to make things that aren't happening a crime, I mean, I suppose I don't really care. And if you're going to ask me, should it, should it be a federal hate crime to lynch somebody? Sure, why not? Okay. But the entire goal of the left here is to, of course, suggest that America remains a deeply racist country, the same country that lynched Emmett Till would lynch black people today if they could get away with it. And this is the elite mentality when it comes to this country. Everything can be shoehorned or, or pushed into the box of racism. This also happens to be how, um, how the media is approaching the Will Smith debacle. So Will Smith, and basically it's over at this point because Will Smith apologized. I'm sure Chris Rock will accept the apology and we will all move on and pretend that none of this ever happened except for the memes, which will remain as they should because the memes are, are awesome. But the left has its take and its take is, of course, that what happened between Will Smith, a black man, and Chris Rock, a black man, is because of white supremacy. Tayo Barrow, writing in The Guardian, quote, most people agree the slap shouldn't have happened, but there's something that feels precious at best and downright racist at worst about white people's reaction to the now infamous smack. The radio host Howard Stern compared Smith to Donald Trump, while white women on Twitter somehow decided Smith's actions meant he must be beating his wife. It would seem there's a layer of hyperviolence that's being projected onto Smith simply because he is a black man who is defending his black wife. Well, no, I think that the hyperviolence being projected onto Smith is because 
He walked up in the middle of one of the most watched broadcasts in America and smacked another man in the face on public television. Like, I'm pretty sure it's that. It, it, it turns out that if you want to label somebody hyperviolent, it turns out that it's not all that hard to do when they just walk up to somebody and beat them on live television. Well, it's justifiable, says this columnist, important even, to interrogate his motives for delivering the slap. It's clear that the backlash against Smith is rooted in not just anti-blackness, but respectability politics as well. It's not about just what Smith did. It's where he did it and who was watching. I find it hard to believe that the same white audiences who consume violence against black people on screen to an almost fetishistic degree are so distraught about an open palm slap. Again, this kind of performative pearl clutching is only ever reserved for black men who mess up. Okay, so let me just point something out right here. Let's say that Bradley Cooper had gotten up and beat the beat like the redheaded stepchild, Chris Rock. Let's say that, that, that whoever Bradley Cooper is, is dating right now, let's say that, that this person had been insulted by Chris Rock and Bradley Cooper had gotten up and just smacked Chris Rock. How do you think that would have gone? You think they would have allowed him to remain? Or let's say, for example, that Chris Rock had not been Chris Rock. He had been a white comedian. Let's say he were Ricky Gervais and he said something bad about Jada Pinkett Smith. And Will Smith had gone up and smacked Ricky Gervais across the face. How do you think people would have generally reacted? On the left, they would have just made him king automatically. He would have just been the king. There wouldn't have been an election. They just would have immediately removed him from the Oscars, put a crown on his head, and he would be king of America. So you're telling me that this is about anti-blackness, but in the left view, everything is about anti-blackness because America is racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe. That's what we all are. And the left will lecture you and lecture your kids on all of this. Because after all, no one should have to take a joke. According to Roxanne Gay, a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, this is not a defense of Will Smith, who does not need me to defend him. Instead, this is a defense of thin skin. It's a defense of boundaries and being human and enforcing one's limits. It's a repudiation of the incessant valorizing of taking a joke, having a sense of humor. It's a rejection of the expectation we laugh off everything people want to say and do to us. Yes, according to this particular columnist, apparently we should stop valorizing taking a joke. Instead, we should be really, really thin-skinned and smack people. That, that's the best thing that we can do. Because if we do that, we will have a better, warmer, more wonderful society. And that, of course, is the goal. It, it is incredible. to you know, A lot of people tried to explain Donald Trump away by talking about his politics. They tried to say that the reason that Donald Trump was elected in 2016 is because Donald Trump was a populist who was anti-free trade in his rhetoric. It's because he was anti-immigration. It was because of this or it was because of that. Donald Trump was elected because he is a pulsating middle finger to all of these people. That is why Donald Trump was elected. And the more the left decides that they are going to hijack your kids and call you a racist and have dinner with Sarah Iral and suggest that you can't speak up on topics, and the more they, they rip on you for saying that it is bad to smack people for telling a joke, the more they do this sort of stuff, the more people are going to rebel by picking whoever is the biggest pulsating middle finger and just throwing it out there at the left. And the left deserves this. They deserve this. Because in their goal to remold society, everybody is either a tool or an obstacle. And if you refuse to be their tool, they will make you their obstacle. So here are your choices, Americans. You can either be the speed bump or even worse, you can be the person. You can be the, the blood bag these folks feed on. You can be the cash infusion for them. You can continue to shop with them. You can continue to give them what they want. You can continue to assume good motives on their part. Or you can look at what they say behind closed doors over at Disney or what they say quite openly if you're Jon Stewart. And you can say to yourself, you know what? I don't feel like patronizing these folks because they hate my guts. They hate my guts. And not only do they hate my guts, they see me as a dangerous obstacle to them by dint of the fact that I am a parent and I wish to raise my children with my values. The best way to strike back against these folks is to parent your kids with your values and protect your kids. That is the number one way that you will end up victorious in life and that your kids will end up with a successful, happy life. Because I promise you, the kids of these folks, I mean, I'm not going to name any names. Let's just say broad swath. The folks who raise these kids with their values, those kids do not look like the happiest of children. They don't look, and they don't seem like the happiest of people as they grow into adults. And our society does not seem massively happier for having embraced a set of values that wishes to subsume basic morality under the rubric of personal authenticity and indoctrination of other people's kids. All right, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of content. In the meantime, go check out the Michael Knowles Show. That's available right now. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is the Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Elliot Feld. 
Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our production manager is Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Bradford Carrington. Editing is by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant, Jessica Crand. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Washburn University's president, a man who invited me, personally invited me by signing a contract to give a speech there tomorrow, has now sent a campus-wide email condemning me for the speech that I have not yet given. Disney has gotten caught peddling transgenderism to kids, and Joe Biden outlaws a crime that does not happen and is already illegal. Good job, Joe. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.